Welcome to First Parish in Milton. My name is Jeff Stote, and I am a member of the Worship Committee. First Parish is a vibrant, welcoming congregation that welcomes all people to grow deep faith and take bold action. We're so glad you're with us here today. This sanctuary is made holy by your presence. Now, if you're joining us for the first time, please take a welcome packet from the Pew Rack. There is information about our services and our child care. If you fill out the yellow card inside the packet and drop it in the offering plate, you will receive our weekly email, which can help you get to know us better. Our greeters, Charlie Frannick and Richard Venable, in the back there, are both wearing uh, colorful tags and they'll be standing by the doors after worship is over. Please join us and uh, Richard and uh, Charlie can walk you to the social hour together and answer your questions. Now we strive to make our worship experience accessible to people of all ages and abilities. Please see the welcome card in your pew for more information on this or speak with an usher at the back of the church. The work of living our faith is done both in and out of worship, so I draw your attention to the printed announcements that came with your order of worship. These announcements are important news of our community life, so please read them carefully. Uh, Parisa is uh, giving the welcome presently at the Children's Church, and she'll be joining us during the opening hymn. Our vision for our congregation includes meaningful service to the community beyond our walls. Now, as part of our work to achieve that vision, we are inviting everyone in the congregation to make a commitment to service to the larger community. Now, this may be something you're already doing and want to tell us about, or it might be a new commitment you make. A list of suggestions is offered and can be found in the parlor just outside these doors or in the foyer on your way to the parish hall. Please take a card and when you've completed it, either put it in the offering plate or one of the service pledge boxes in the parlor or the parish hall foyer. We'll be collecting the cards through October the 20th then making a list of commitments and networking folks doing similar things so we can be in reflection as community about how we transform ourselves and our faith through service. Extending a generous welcome is a spiritual practice and I invite us all to extend that welcome to our neighbors by taking a few minutes to greet them warmly. Please stand as you are willing and able and join us in our opening hymn, uh, number 38 in the gray hymnal, Morning Has Broken. Anderson lights our chalice this morning. And as Henry lights the chalice, let's say together the call to worship. 
Come, let us gather. We gather to celebrate the sacred within and among us. We come to seek spiritual growth and understanding. We strive to practice acceptance, forgiveness, and love. Together, we work to build a world with justice and compassion. Come, let us gather together. Thanks, Anna. We gather together in body, in this physical space each week, to explore the things of the spirit. Your presence makes this space holy, we say in our words of welcome, and we mean it. This month, we explore the sacredness of our bodies in all their shapes and sizes, abilities and limits, smoothness and wrinkles. And we begin with this poem by Alyssa Lee called Body. Map of terror and pleasure, ardent junk, passionate congress, filled with the arguments of chemicals, echo chamber for the fanatical cries of stubborn generations, all the quaint invisibles death has grown a beard on, labyrinth of desire, playing field of impulse, factory where decay's silent armies clock in, philosopher clown blowing a horn at each epiphany. Washed by the rough nurse of morning, wheeled into the ward of the afternoon, feeds great, grateful at the rich broth of dusk, reads the erratic cards of dreams, turns on the rack of insomnia, steals the two-bit grace of sleep, loses its name in foreign embraces, forges a passport to the country of tenderness, gestures like a child at the thing it wants, opaque from its own breath on the glass. Our bodies, the gift, the blessing, the complication. The reading this morning is from a book called Waking, a memoir of trauma and transcendence by Matthew Sanford. When he was 13, Sanford was in a car accident. 
that left him paralyzed from the chest down and killed his father and sister. He is now a yoga instructor and an expert in mind-body integration. Sanford writes, in principle, my experience is not different from yours. It is only more extreme. If I asked you to stretch the muscles between your ribs or to directly lift your arches, chances are you would have no idea how to proceed. We all live with versions of mind-body disconnection. My mind-body relationship changed in an instant, the time it took for my back to break. But the changing relationship between mind and body is a defining feature of everyone's life. We are all leaving our bodies. This is the inevitable arc of living. Death cannot be avoided. Neither can the inward silence that comes with the aging process. I now experience a different, more subtle connection between mind and body. It does not require that I flex muscles. It does not dissipate in the presence of increasing inward silence. In fact, this connection depends on it. It does require, however, that I seek more profoundly within my own experience and do so with an open mind. It means that I must reach intuitively into what may feel like darkness. If nothing else, my life has taught me one thing. The mind and body that I have are the only mind and body that I have. They deserve my attention, and when I give it, I receive so much more in return. Learning to fall gracefully through one's mind-body relationship is not a submission. One learns to fall gracefully in order to roll. There is still so much to realize. My experience tells me that the silence within us can be experienced energetically as a nourishing sap. When this happens, consciousness changes shape. For example, I have never seen anyone truly become more aware of his or her body without becoming more compassionate. A mental state like tolerance can deepen into a three-dimensional state of true patience. Nonviolence can become more than a moral principle. It can become an integrated state of consciousness that includes the body. And of course, for good or for bad, the silence within us also contains the opportunity for choice. Here ends the reading.
in time we will all be stars. We humans are born with these extraordinary bodies, bodies that need a lot of care and attention, dependent for our care on those who are much larger than we are for so much longer than any other animal when we're born. Our brains grow at phenomenal rates in our first years as the rest of our bodies grow to many times their original weight and height. Those tiny newborn fingers with their indescribably small and insanely sharp little nails <laughs> give way in no time to hands that reach for baseball gloves and tie shoes and knot up into fists that mean business. Watching kids on the playground, seeing my own kids grow and develop, I've often been reminded of something that I forgot somewhere on the way to adulthood. We are born loving these bodies, loving them unconditionally. There's nothing that compares to that divine mix of terror and joy on a baby's face when she takes her first steps without falling. The glee of a child wobbling, then gliding away solo on two wheels. The full, unselfconscious abandon of a kid dancing, especially when they think no one can see them. Our physical beings give us our greatest strengths and also our greatest vulnerability. The gift of life and the truth of our mortality are always deep in our awareness, even from that youngest, those youngest ages. And we learn along the way that all of those glorious accomplishments of the body, that pain is an important part of the equation as well. It lets us know our limits, most literally the place where we end and the pavement begins. But also that injury is the place where our minds wish and our body's ability part ways. And along the way to getting all of those motor skills that many of us are lucky enough to enjoy, we also discover we have different levels of ability. Our bodies come in different sizes, run at different speeds, grow at different rates. Slowly, almost inevitably, the shadow side of the gift of our human ability to reason shows itself. Our bodies become a battleground for all of the insecurities of our lives. It happens painfully early. Just a few weeks ago, I had to break up a shouting match between my four-year-old and his best pal on the street. The subject was who was taller. My son was vehemently arguing that he was taller against all visible evidence that he was not. <laughs> what this says about his character aside, we start comparing pretty young. Who's taller leads to that question of who's stronger and when it, whether it's interpersonal or international, we know what happens next. Bodies are at stake to prove a point sacrificed in the struggle for power. From domestic violence to political torture, slavery to incarceration, reproductive rights to affordable health care, hate crimes to who it's okay to love and how our bodies are meant to be gendered. We play these struggles for power and superiority out on a landscape of very real flesh. There seems to be something nearly unavoidable in our nature and certainly in human history about that fact. Thankfully, the worlds of advertising and marketing have this competition for power through health and strength and that far off dream of immortality figured out and they help us right along with that shadow side of our nature. We live with daily messages, so many of them contradictory even, about how we can live longer with less illness and be more beautiful all the while. Reports of the health benefits of red wine and dark chocolate are welcome news. B vitamins, calcium and folate, okay, those are easy enough. Then we get to the weight loss tips. No carbs, all right, some carbs, no fat. Okay, well, some fat, but it has to be the right kind of fat, and God help you if you get them mixed up. 
There's one trend after another promising the exercise that will give us the best gain for the shortest amount of effort or the least amount of time. From jazzercise to Pilates to the seven minute workout, some of us have tried it all. And that's not even to mention the enormous market about how to beautify our bodies. The countless magazines that give advice about hairstyles and makeup and what to wear to hide whatever part of our body we feel embarrassed about today. And on any given night, you can flip channels with even the most basic cable package and see no fewer than a dozen shows that offer expert criticism of someone else's appearance. Should we wonder why obesity and eating disorders are at epidemic levels? And all of what I said applies to those folks who have what activists call our temporarily able bodies. The expectations we lay on ourselves and others when our bodies are less than fully able, when we are ill or injured, there are even more layers of shame and pressure that stack up. Vanquish that enemy illness. Conquer that pain. Our bodies become our enemies in so many ways. The author of this morning's reading, Matthew Sanford, was badly injured in a car accident at the age of 13. And he lost the ability to voluntarily control anything from his chest down. In the process of his recovery, he reports being told that his job now was to live through the upper half of his body, to make just that part of his body compensate for the rest of the whole of it, being pretty much ready to shut off the presence of that part of his being that he could not move. So he got a lot of praise for developing that upper body, for having strong, bulky arms and being able to move his wheelchair with those. He describes this strategy as being helpful for a time. It kept him from false hope of regaining ability to move his lower extremities through his own will. But the fact was that his whole body was present, even though he didn't have direct control over part of it. And he discovered that part of his road to health would have to include embracing his whole body, allowing himself to occupy it and claim it as his own window on the world. His path to this was through yoga, and what he describes as allowing himself to fall more deeply into his body. Instead of intensely trying to control one part to make up for another, instead of trying to run from pain and discomfort, he had to let himself take a deep breath and move right into it. Paradoxically, this reduced his pain and discomfort and made it possible for him to feel whole. He likens it to a child who has had some small injury and comes to a parent for a hug. Instinctively, when we're injured, we can tighten ourselves up against pain, try to fight it off with our own tension. But as soon as that child gets a hug, you can feel them relax and drop down into their bodies. And when they do, the pain is actually lessened. The hug gives them a boundary to their experience, helps them to contain it, and somehow makes it okay. Not painless, not like it was before, but bearable. It's in our bodies that we express our deepest connections with our fellow beings, our tender moments with lovers, with children, with parents, with pets, with any of our loved ones as they die. That's where most of us, regardless of our belief in a God, might say that we have experienced something transcendent. In those moments, we feel that indescribable connection that doesn't belong to one being or another, and is greater than the sum of those parts. It's undeniably holy. So what if our revolutionary act of faith was to live according to the truth of that power in each of us? What if we began a practice of falling into our bodies, of being with that inner silence, just as our bodies are, letting ourselves be held by that mystery greater than us all, 
the embrace of the very universe that miraculously made our existence possible, that universe in which we might become one with the sun. Mother Teresa, who spent her time among the very sick and very poor in Kolkata, asked how she could endure the harsh conditions, said, we are called to move from repulsion to compassion and compassion to wonderment. The conditions of our bodies, of bodies of others that are strange to us, of the suffering of the bodies of people near and dear to us and people on the other side of the world, call us to move from revulsion to compassion, from compassion to wonderment. If we stay at the stage of repulsion with our own bodies, with our neighbors, with those who are suffering, we're too fat, too ugly, too weak. If we stay at that stage, we cut off a sacred message. We reinforce that separation that leaves us lonely, isolated, suffering. We lose the power of all of the many ways we are whole. What if we were to embrace and love what our bodies have to teach us in our strengths and in our limitations? If we can learn that lesson, the whole world is open to us, open to that sense of wonderment. That world takes on new depths of compassion and a whole new realm of connection. Jane Pointer, a scientist who lived in Biosphere 2, an intentional community that attempted to create a simulation of the Earth's ecosystem enclosed in glass in the Arizona desert. Anyone remember this experiment? She says, the Industrial Revolution and Prometheus have given us this, the ability to light up the world. It has also given us this, the ability to look at our world from the outside. And if you lose where you are in your biosphere or are perhaps having difficulty connecting with where you are in the biosphere, I would say to you, take a deep breath. The yogis had it right. Breath does, in fact, connect us all in a very literal way. Take a breath now. Take a breath now. And as you breathe, think about what is in your breath. There, perhaps, is the CO2 from the person sitting next to you. Maybe there's a little bit of oxygen from some algae on the beach not far from here. It also connects us in time. There may be some carbon in your breath from the dinosaurs. There could also be carbon that you are exhaling now that will be in the breath of your great, great, great grandchildren. In this great journey of our lives, may we find companions for what feels like a journey that belongs to the able and the swift, but really belongs to all of us who can appreciate and embrace the lessons of our existence, of connection through suffering, of power through presence, of being loved as a sacred being, no matter what our bodies can or cannot do. Let us sing now a prayer for connection as we make our way through life. In honor of these temples of sacred wisdom that we clothe and bathe and care for every day. We'll sing Spirit of Life. I'm going to show you a body prayer as it's played once through and then we'll sing it and then we'll, the choir and I will sing it and we'll invite you to do the body prayer with us. And remain seated to do the body prayer. Just let yourself sink right in.
Let us pray. Spirit of life, woven through every fiber of our being, celebrated in every synapse, each layer of tissue, of bone, of vein, and artery, give us peace with who we are, with these skins we live in. Whatever their size, their shape, their desire, let them be holy. Let our bodies be the poem of our lives in which the everyday is exalted and meaning is found in our celebration of the gift. Let those whose bodies, by virtue of their identity, by their ethnicity, by their sexual identity or orientation, by their poverty, for those who are told that their bodies are less than, we send a prayer of solidarity, a commitment to join our bodies in the struggle for equity, for celebration of the preciousness of each life, not just in theory, but in the practice of our nations and governments. We care for one another's bodies and spirits as we pray for their comfort and healing. And we lift up those to whom we offer the hope and care that's needed. <clears throat> With Tracy, we lift up prayers for Julie and Dale as jail enters hospice. We lift up prayers for my friend and colleague, Terry Burke, the minister of our congregation in Jamaica Plain with stage four lung cancer. With Lynn, we lift up prayers for her best friend, Lisa, who's battling cancer. With Ian and Donna Torney, we lift up prayers for their friends, the Dixons, who lost their 24-year-old son. And with Ruth, prayers for the family of Rebecca, who died Thursday of pancreatic cancer. May the bodies of those who remain, of those who surround those who are ill, be the healing gifts that are needed to comfort those in suffering and loss, to reclaim the life that can be found in the midst of struggle. We share also the celebration of our bodies, our gathered body of children in the Children's Church this morning for the first time since a beautiful renovation of the building. For the joy that we share with Temple Beth Shalom of the Blue Hills, that it has found a new home. And we send our prayers to all of those near to us and far for the greater gift of knowing our bodies as sacred in every corner of the world. In the name of all that is holy to each of us, amen. Hello, my name is Tara Kuzno. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. 
I have come to a place in my life as a clinician and a facilitator for healing of immense respect for the body. To me, the essence of the body is the breath. I believe the breath is sacred for it sends life into our bodies, even if our bodies are not working or are in pain. It is breath that also connects us to the divine outside of our bodies and bridges the physical with the spiritual. It is the thread between the body, mind, and spirit and links us to all humanity. Breath is a gift that many of us take for granted and we've become dissociated from it over the course of our life. It's a curious thing how and why this happens because simple attention to the breath enables us to connect to our bodies, to our senses, to our intuition, and our gifts. I have been both a student and a practitioner of mind-body medicine for many years. And here's what I know for sure. We hold on to memories in our bodies and in our minds. They take hold and lay their images and fragments in the nooks and crannies of our bodies. And our bodies carry these impressions of our world, the impressions of those who raise us, and the culture that envelops us. And we are often unaware of these impressions and how they cause both suffering and joy. The breath is an instrument of the body, and when we tend to it with the care and awe it deserves, we engage in an act of self-compassion. My journey to this church and to this place in my life now is about compassion. Compassion for the self and compassion for others. And the latter is much easier to do than the former. It is much easier to relate to the suffering of others than it is to the suffering within ourself. But compassion for the self begins with the body. In an odd way, it's why I'm standing here today. We joined this church because a colleague of mine, her name is Angel, and she is my angel, told me about a church called the UU that offered comprehensive sex education to its youth with another odd acronym called OWL. And the moment I heard her story about the church in this program, when Sophie and Josie, my daughters, were only three and one, I made it a quest to find out more. You see, I wanted my girls to move in the world with a solid sense of who they are, how their bodies work, and how humans are connected to one another, and how they are in service to one another. I grew up in an era where moms did not talk about menarche, the church forbid discussion about intimacy, and where babies were flown in by storks or magically conceived. At the same time, my dad had Playboy magazines and the hardcover of Joy of Sex on the coffee table. <laughs> it was the 1970s, and my parents were divorced too. A little bit of a dichotomy. So we had many images and no discussion. There was a deep polarization between what was taboo and exploitation. And it's not that much different in today's culture. In many ways, it is worse because the images our children see are more graphic, violent, and accessible. When I reflect on the girlfriends in my circle growing up who experienced teen pregnancy, abortion, dating abuse, and rape, we fall into the star stark statistics of one in three. One in three women will experience some kind of sexual violence by the time they graduate from college. One in three. And those numbers haven't moved much at all. Progress has been slow. Might my girls be the lucky, unaffected two out of those three? So I come back to the body is sacred, the breath as a channel to connect ourselves to the subtle sense of the body and to the intuition of an open mind. Our bodies are emotional radar systems, constantly giving off signals. And we close ourselves off from this really important information. We strive to avoid suffering and pain, and then we also close ourselves off to joy. 
It is with some comfort that I've brought my family here. I know that my girls, at the very least, who are now 13 and 15, are able to name body parts, thanks to OWL, um, develop a sense of self-respect and boundaries, and begin to understand intimacy in relationships, and above all, have a sense of the body as sacred. In the uh, compassionate spirit of this faith community, so beautifully expressed by Tara, let us generously give our offering this morning.
join me in the unison dedication. May these gifts be transformed into strength for this faith community, into comfort, food, and shelter for those in need, and may we be transformed by generosity. Please join in singing our final hymn, number 298, Wake Now My Senses. benediction is the words of Walt Whitman, from which the song that Pat sang so beautifully earlier also came. This is what you shall do. Love the earth and the sun and the animals. Despise riches. Give alms to anyone that asks. 
Stand up for the stupid and crazy. Devote your income and labor to others. Hate tyrants. Argue not concerning God. Have patience and indulgence toward the people. Take off your hat to nothing known or unknown or to any men or number of men. Go freely with the powerful, uneducated persons and with the young and with mothers of families. Read these leaves in the open air every season of every year of your life. Re-examine all you have been told at school or church or in any book. Dismiss whatever insults your own soul, and your flesh shall be a great poem, and have the rich fluency not only in its words, but in the silent lines of its lips and face, and between the lashes of your eyes, and in every motion and joint of your body. Go in peace to celebrate the sacred in every movement of your life, especially the gift of this body. Amen.